So I'd like to welcome everybody, especially our uh, guests from outside the PACE community. And uh, we have a uh, class here, Professor Alex Sarian's uh, Management 370 class. I'd like to also thank the eLab staff, who's done a lot of work to pull this together. Our panelists, uh, Julie Geither, Juliet Nieves, Krista Gray-Page, and our moderator, Allison Hawns, as well as the Women in Business Steering Committee, who's graciously providing a wine and cheese reception after the, uh, the roundtable discussion. If I could ask you um, not to turn off your telephones, but just to put them on mute and use them to uh, tweet about the event, if you like. You can see on the cover, um, the Pace eLab is at Pace eLab, and we're using the hashtag uh, Pace WER, WER for Women's Entrepreneur Roundtable, Women Entrepreneurs Roundtable. And we'll take some of the, the questions during the Q&A via Twitter as well, especially if you tweet all the wonderful things happen and people from the outside world tweeting questions. So I'm Bruce Backenheimer. I'm a clinical professor of management and the executive director of the Entrepreneurship Lab at Pace. The Entrepreneurship Lab is a space um, designed to bring together students from Pace's six schools and colleges in order to provide uh, cross-disciplinary problem solving, experiential learning, and the development of an entrepreneurial mindset. In addition to providing staff assistance and valuable technology resources such as a 3D printer and a video studio um, and high-end Alienware computers and many, many other things. We have a, um, a great staff, qualified people. We also run a lot of events, a pitch contest, business plan competition, mobile app design contest, speaker series, networking events, um, as well as, as workshops and mentoring programs. Two upcoming events on March 27th, it's a Friday, the whole day we're going to have the App Design Contest 3.0, the third year that we're doing the App Design Contest, but also an all-day hackathon. So if you're interested, pay student in, in web um, mobile app development, we're going to take you from scratch to uh, help you design, um, design an app through this hackathon. And then in the evening, we'll have a uh, exhibition and prizes. Then on April 16th, which is a Thursday evening here in the Bianco Room, we have the 11th annual Pace Pitch Contest. That's where approximately 10 finalists will make a three-minute pitch, can use up to five slides, and we'll have a distinguished panel of judges. So the Entrepreneurship Lab, aside from doing all this, is also meant to just be a home base for those interested in entrepreneurship. And I'd encourage you to visit not only the facility, which is just one block away at 163 William Street on the third floor, but to visit the, the website. There's hundreds and hundreds of pages of, of information and videos and pictures. Uh, Pace.edu slash elab, E-L-A-B for Entrepreneurship Lab. So just to give you a little background of this event and how it came about, we were um, very fortunate to have received a gift from uh, Ted and Pat Levine, who are here in the, the front row. And they funded the Ted and Pat Levine Proof of Concept Entrepreneurship Initiative. It was a gift to provide three students with a $5,000 grant. It's no equity, not a loan. It doesn't have to be repaid to test a concept, to test an entrepreneurial concept. It's, um, Ted is the founder of Development Counselors International, which was founded 50 years ago. It's a marketing agency, but not for products or services, but for countries and places. And as a successful, a successful entrepreneur, um, you know, really believes in entrepreneurship, even at a, a patriotic level, that that's what America needs for prosperity, job creation, et cetera, and has, has funded this um, this year and next. So what happened was the program was just launched in this room on September 30th. October 20th was the deadline for applications. November 10th, we picked the finalists. December 15th, um, the, the winners. And January, just last month, the program starts. It's a, a full year program where the um, people you see here, Julia 
um, Juliet, Krista, as well as um, Paige Checky was the, the fourth finalist. And Paige, uh, just so you know, her concept, since she's not here, um, she had a, a prior family commitment, is something called Shearstock, Shearstock.com. It's a subscription service for women's hosiery. Um, but you'll, you'll hear about these entrepreneurs are at different stages. One thing that was really um, interesting, is probably not the best word, but, but neat, was that when we picked the, the four finalists, it was a, a very long and extensive application process with six or seven different pieces of, of information and details and letters of recommendation and plans that had to be submitted with financials, the four finalists were all women and were from four different schools and colleges at Pace. So we have one from uh, the Dyson College of Arts and Sciences is Paige. Julie's from the Seidenberg School of Computer Science and Information Systems. Juliet is from the School of Performing Arts. And Krista is an alum, an MBA class of 2013 from the Lubin School of Business. So that just um, worked out in you know, nice, and then we had the idea, let's do, let's do an event around this. So that's why we're all here this evening. I'd like to um, introduce and then turn it over to um, Allison Hans, who's going to be moderating. Allison is an award, Emmy Award winning journalist and TV reporter, but Allison is also a true entrepreneur. She's the host of Working Woman Report, a, a TV program that she started from scratch. It was, um, I was pleased to get to know Allison while she was creating the show and honored to have appeared on the, the premiere episode. So with that, I um, just so you know the program is I'm going to turn over to Allison. Allison will run the, um, the round table for an hour, then we'll have a 15 minute Q&A session, and then I'm going to introduce um, Marie Tulantis for the closing remarks. So with that, Thank you, Allison. Hey, thank you, Bruce. Well, thank you all for coming out here tonight. I know it's freezing out there and uh, hard to get around, but uh, I'm so uh, thrilled to be here and on the stage with these great women. Uh, I'm just, I love entrepreneurship. I didn't uh, know I loved entrepreneurship until I was kind of burst <laughs> into it. Uh, my background is as a reporter and anchor journalist. So uh, I started off in uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, covering snowstorms and fires. And then I was in Pittsburgh and Connecticut. And really, all of my life, it was about uh, reporting and anchoring. And a couple of years ago, I started to see the technology changing. Uh, in the world, I started to see the newsroom changing. And also, as a woman, I saw a lot of issues coming up in terms of the workplace and balancing home and work. And I saw this whole burst of entrepreneurship coming on the scene. And so it was something that I wanted to take a look at. And I was uh, working uh, freelance in the city and I had I'd pitched it to a few people and and nobody really grabbed a hold of it uh, and I said you know what I'm gonna do it myself so I went out there and I hired a photographer and an editor and I started putting pieces together and really just made the show come together out of these stories of women who have a passion, have an idea, and want to get something done. And what I love about all of these women who you'll meet tonight, every, every idea is, 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 is from a passion deep down that they're trying to create a business from. And I think that's just absolutely beautiful. So my program, uh, which uh, airs on New York City Live TV, which is uh, Channel 25 here in the city, it's uh, basically we focus on female entrepreneurs and we do stories about them. And I think that all three ladies up here would make great stories for our show in the future. But uh, that's a little background uh, on myself. I'd like to introduce the, the main players here tonight. Uh, Julie 
Okay, so Julie, uh, and is it Gauthier? Yes. Gauthier is the co-founder of Codapillar. And I would rather have Julie tell me about her company from her, from in your own words than me describe it because this is your baby. So tell us a little bit about Codapillar. Codapillar is a social web application and also a set of curriculums that makes learning how to code, just basic web programming, a little bit easier. Um, what I've found is that it's really difficult to learn how to code, particularly if you're thrown into a situation where you really didn't want to, and particularly in classes now, it's starting to, to come up more often. Um, and it just, it's not taught in a really fun way. It's not emphasizing that coding is creative, and it's social, and it's collaborative. So Codapillar aims to build a web platform that makes it more social, collaborative, and fun to just code little things. Okay, so we're really in the computer science and STEM fields, which are so popular right now. I, I, next, I'd like to introduce Juliet, and she is the co-founder of Reaction Dance Company. Now, this is a completely different idea, and, and, and Juliet, why don't you go ahead and, and describe your company? So Reaction is a dance entertainment company which specializes in making customizable dance performances and lessons. So for like corporate events or parties or weddings, I mean, uh, in about two weeks we have our first wedding, uh, a Pakistani wedding where we're going to do a Bollywood hip hop fusion piece. So our company is based off of um, unique dance performances. So. Here in New York, it's very emphasized in like hip hop and contemporary things you see on like So You Think You Can Dance and theater performances, but people often forget about the other dance styles out there like salsa, samba, bachata, all these Latin forms as well as Bollywood, all these Eastern dance forms. And we kind of separate all these different styles, but if we bring them together, we can create something unique, some unique dance form. Um, in New York itself, 70.8% of the population is non-white of some other place in the world, so Asians, Hispanics. So it's better to have a dance form that um, is an expression of everybody rather than just one type of person out there. Wonderful. and. <laughs> Finally, we have Krista with uh, 50 Roots. And uh, tell us a little bit about your company. Sure. Um, my company is 50roots.com. Sorry. And we are an online store that sells made in America products only. So a lot of gift items, home goods, um, gifts for men, women, children, pets. Um, yeah, everything's American made with every product on our site. We show where it's made in the US, and we tell the story of the maker. Okay, so to jump in here, so Krista, how did you come up with your idea, your concept? Well, um, I worked as a product development manager in the apparel industry for about eight years, and I realized throughout my career, everything we developed and manufactured was made overseas. Nothing I worked on was made in the U.S., and it just didn't really um, sit right with me, and I started to think about it more and more as our economy started to decline and unemployment started to rise, how important it is to focus on American innovation and American manufacturing. So my idea for 50 Roots was born from that. And so if you go to the website, just so we can paint a picture yeah, sure. here, if we go to the website of 50, uh, 50 Roots, mm -hmm. you see the United States of America, and, then, yes. and you're trying to basically get products handmade products from each state, and then you're curating them? How does it work? Exactly. Um, well, we, our mission is to feature at least one product from every state. So we have a mission map on our site, um, and every time we have a new product from a new state, that state will light up on our map. So currently we're 44% complete on our mission with 22 states. So we basically buy everything from wholesalers and retail them on our site to consumers. And what could those products possibly be? Um, well, for example, a lot of the products we carry have a great story, which is why it's so important for us to spotlight the maker and their story. Um, 
we carry these great wallets, for example, from this company called Alchemy Goods, and they're based in Seattle, Washington. And the company was started by a guy who was a bike messenger, and somebody happened to steal his messenger bag one day. So he had all these old tires lying around his apartment, and he just created his own messenger bag from the inner tubes from all the tires. So this whole collection of wallets and belts and accessories was born. So yeah, items like that. So with with your company, what is essentially the business model? You're bringing, you're bringing these makers together, and then how does it work? Well, it's a B2C model. So basically, I purchase all the inventory, warehouse it. Um, we receive orders through our website. I ship them directly to, to the consumer. And it's a great model to actually warehouse the inventory because it allows me better control over shipping and customer service. It's an opportunity for branding. I can ship in all my own packaging and include some marketing materials for our customers in each package that I send out. And so where, where are you housing all the inventory? Um, I have a 2,000 square foot office slash warehouse space in Poughkeepsie, New York, which is in Dutchess County, about an hour and a half north of here. Okay, so it's really, it's, it's a hard product. The products come in and then you're shipping them out. Exactly. Okay, which is a little <laughs> different than what Julie and Juliet are doing because they're, it's more conceptual. So, so Julie, where are you at with your company right now? We're in the product development phase right now. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a programmer, so I'm just programming away at it right now, and I'm asking for help from lots of programmer friends. So if anyone is an expert in JavaScript and Ruby, <laughs> um, come talk to me. Um, so right now we're just trying to build a really great product that we can pitch to more schools. Um, I'm in the stage of teaching right now and collecting even more research from my students as to what challenges they're facing and trying to figure out how that I can best, best address them um, in our product. So what would your business model be? Um, so really we're, we're targeting um, schools and having schools that are now trying to implement these coding programs uh, purchase into Codapillar and purchase this, uh, like access to this web application so that the students can go in and get more instructional material as they're coding, but also being able to experience this really fun side of coding while they're working on it and something that they can work on at home as well. Um, we're also just having this great open platform um, for people who aren't paying to, to use it but just want to build cool things and have a profile of just little like JavaScript games that they've built and things like that. Um, so really, we're, we're kind of targeting like young people who want to learn how to code. And so when you started this concept, you, you had a friend who also has joined you in, in the process. W tell me that moment that the light went off. Um, so my friend Olga and I have been teaching um, a lot of web development since I've been at Pace. And Olga recently was working on all the CIS 101 curriculums and revamping them, which is our introductory to uh, computers course. And that includes a section on HTML. And so she was always asking for my input on it. And we were talking about it a lot. And then one night, we were sitting at the computer science school. And we were talking about being women in technology and some opportunities that were available to us, um, some different grants and things. And we were talking about how cool it would be to take advantage of some of these go and teach somewhere around the world, teach some coding, um, because these are two of our passions, are traveling and teaching code. And, um, and then the next, the next morning, I was thinking about it in the shower. I was like, wait a minute. That platform that I've been working on, we could combine these two ideas, teach some code, build this platform. And so right away, I texted Olga, and I said, listen, are you in? And, and she said, well, yeah, obviously. <laughs> and we started work the next day. Great. And, and Juliet, how did, how did, where did your idea come from? So actually, um, being in the performing arts school, you kind of wonder where you fit in in the dance world or wherever you are in the performing arts. Um, and so like last year was junior year, and I was just kind of like wondering, what, what do I want to do with this? How am I going to make a difference here? So I kind of realized what made me different is that I, I love all types of dance styles, um, not just like the Western ideas of what dances are, like contemporary and hip hop. And even though I love both of those ideas, I love exploring all these other cultural forms like Bollywood and, and Latin dances. And I thought what was also missing was um, a unique expression of dance. I felt that there needed to be more 
we need to combine these styles together instead of making them separate. So if you see a dance performance, it's like a contemporary performance, a hip hop performance, a Bollywood performance, instead of like conjoining them together. So for instance, I'm of mixed culture, I'm Puerto Rican and I'm German, so for an idea of like a mixed experience would be like a samba with um, some contemporary, so you mix those elements together and create a new unique expression from them. And I, I wanted to be able to give dancers, um, so from that sprouted the idea of starting my own company. And a best, the best way to do that would be like a dance entertainment company so that we could actually make money from this. And for instance, like corporate events always want to have a little entertainment in between all of their sessions and whatever their seminars that day or parties at night. So like we uh, did Omicron Entertainment had a Halloween party and we uh, danced on the stage for them. Um, and then weddings are a big factor, cultural factor to have lots of dancing. So we have this uh, wedding, a uh, Pakistani wedding in two weeks from now. Uh, so a big part of Pakistani and Indian culture is to have lots and lots of dancing at their parties. And they love the idea of fusing different styles together that makes them really happy. So um, I'm really excited about that. So the business model is going out and basically booking events. Yes. yes. How do you do that? Yeah, so that's kind of hard. But yeah. <laughs> um, so I've, I've been doing a lot of stuff outside of the school ever since I've been here. I've been here um, for like four years. So I've done dance teams and um, I've done stuff with dance companies. Um, so through all those things, you meet people who are like the managers, uh, uh, managing of entertainment companies, and you start to make connections. It's all about connections. Who do you know? Who needs dancers? And you just start to make more and more connections, and they know you dance. Oh, I remember you did this party. Can you do this party now? We need dancers. We need choreographers. And I'm like, yes, I'll do that. And then besides just you know networking, besides that, um, there's I've also put out a website, a Facebook, and I'm trying to like, we want to do like a wedding expo actually, like a, a an Indian wedding expo in like April. So hopefully we can get more uh, like people that aren't normally knowing what the dance world is like into it and understand. Oh, we can have dancers at our wedding. That's awesome. Like it's a great entertainment idea. Yeah, that's great. So you guys are all from different schools, which I love. Did I, I, you have the business background. Did you ladies think that you would ever be business owners? No, <laughs> no, no. I had no idea. <laughs> Do you like that? Yeah, I love just coming upon it. Like I just found, uh, there's a class that Professor Brockenheimer teaches, um, entrepreneurship initiative class, what is it called again? Entrepreneurial implementation. <laughs> Entrepreneurial <laughs> implementation, yes. And I didn't know where to start. I didn't know how I was going to make this business possible. And I'm like, I need to take a class. And my friend's like, oh, there's this new class. See if you can be in it. And I, I emailed the professor because I didn't have any of the prerequisites. And I'm like, please, can I be part of this class? <laughs> and so <laughs> that helped me. So he helped me put together like a real business model. And then from there, I learned about the grant, which helped a lot to fund it, because I didn't have any money of my own to put toward it, really. So, yeah. And so, Krista, now, where are you with your business and in terms of scaling the business? What are your goals? Well, we first went live November 2013, so we've been up and running for about a year and a half now. Um, we just had a very successful holiday season, which was awesome. Great. Thanks. That's Thank you. <laughs> um, so we're looking to kind of expand our inventory more, maybe explore apparel. Because right now, like I said, it's mostly gift items, home goods, accessories, things like that. Um, also move into kind of an apothecary section, personal care, wellness. That seems to be um, very big business right now and important so and there's a lot of great American made products in that category um, that I'd like to bring to the consumer as well so what have you uh, found to be the biggest challenges so far um, well first finding American made products you know it really is quite a feat. Uh, we go to I go with my business partner to trade shows and we walk up and down every 
aisle because there's no specific American made section and you really have to look and and find it, you know. So that's the biggest challenge. The second is, you know, my background is design and manufacturing. So the web development side of this project has been a huge challenge for me and I'm just learning new stuff every day. So yeah. And I love it. <laughs> that's great. That's great. And what do you think the challenges have been on your end? Um, some of the challenges for Codepillar have uh, just really been finding the time to get this product out. Um, it's not been hard to find people who want to learn how to code. I meet a lot of people who want to learn how to code, but definitely having the, this product uh, built and ready for a lot of use is, has been, definitely been a challenge for us. What do you think the biggest challenge has been for you? Um, I think getting it out there. Uh, not a lot of people want to pay for dance. Um, that's actually something you kind of are grown up with. If you know you you have a passion for dance and uh, you want to be a dancer, you're always a lot of people kind of try to steer you away from the arts because there's no money in the arts, right? <laughs> um, but so to get people to realize, oh, like there's a lot of effort put into this, not only effort, but like there's a lot of value in, in this type of uh, entertainment. Uh, so that, and also like finding, finding dancers, because this is a new idea of fusing dance styles together. There's a lot of very versatile dancers out there that have training in hip hop and contemporary and Bollywood and stuff like that, but to get them on board to wanna do something where they're not gonna be paid yet, hopefully wanna do that for sure, um, uh, and just get them on board to wanting to try new styles and evolve as dancers is, is kind of hard, yeah. And do you have a vision where the company would be five, ten years down the road, whether you'd have <laughs> franchises? Uh, I don't, that's, that's a really good question. Um, I kind of, I do, at the moment we're not a school but I would like to have a school later on because I feel I kind of want to change the culture of dance through this. Um, I want to create new unique styles and kind of like push art forward. So it's also, it's, you know, getting gigs and, and uh, spreading the word about dance doesn't have to be one type of thing like contemporary hip hop. It can be a unique mix of all these different styles, but also teach that to the next generation because no one knows about this yet, really. No one knows you can do this type of stuff. So I want to educate people on it. Mm -hmm. and now, are any of you guys uh, interested in going out and raising money to build your businesses? Or are you, at this point, slow and steady? I mean, you're in different places. Uh, Krista. Um, we're slow and steady, you know, growing a little bit at a time, but at a pace that we can manage. So, yeah, we're, we're great. <laughs> and have you identified who your real com competitors are in the marketplace or who would be like you? Yeah, um, there's a couple websites that are dedicated to American Made, but they don't um, really warehouse the product or sell directly to consumers. It's more of a brokerage model where they connect the buyer to the seller. But I would say at this point, Uncommon Goods is our biggest competitor. Now they're not American made only, but they are. I noticed after we launched, they really started to push American made. They put up a Pinterest map that looked just like ours, showing where every product was made in the US, that same as, same as we do. So, um, but they're you know, a B2C also and e-commerce. So I would say that they are our biggest competitor at this time. Do you get better at, at kind of guessing how much product to bring in and then how much product is going out the door? Is that, is there yes. science? Yeah, and that was um, one of my biggest concerns when we first launched. I thought, I don't know how much inventory to buy. You know, it was really shooting from the hip. So I, I've definitely learned over the last year and a half, you know, what are more popular items are, what will sell the best, and I'm able to place reorders very quickly, which is great about a lot of our um, vendors being small businesses. They can really turn stuff around for us quickly. And the fact that the merchandise isn't coming from overseas, I mean, I can get it back into my inventory in less than a week, so, which is great. Can you, I don't want to, I mean, I am going to put you on the spot, but it, just so we can have a tangible example, do you have an example of when the ordering went really well 
or when the ordering went awry? Um, let me think. Really well was, you know, this holiday season. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of orders coming in where, you know, I was shipping like 50 orders a week and it was just me and my husband's my business partner, so he'd come in and help one or two days a week. And we managed to get everything out to all our customers in time and it, it worked beautifully. I was, I was definitely nervous lo logistics-wise about how this was all gonna go down, but, but we managed it really well, so. So there, have there been times where you're sitting there with a bunch of product that you don't know what to do with? Um, yeah, I mean, we did last, towards the end of last summer, we had quite a bit still in stock, and what we did was actually really fun. We did a pop-up shop. This was our first storefront that we actually had at the Dutchess County Fair, which is the largest county fair in New York State. It gets about 400,000 people. And we built this small pop-up shop and, you know, branded it really well and got a ton of traffic and a lot of sales, residual sales, from people stopping by our booth. But we were able to sell a lot of our merchandise that wasn't moving. So it was, it was great. And we're going to go back again and do it this year. And it was really nice to be in front of your customer because up to that point, we were just strictly e-commerce. That's a, that's a great idea. How did you come up with that idea to, let's do the pop-up shop and you can clear inventory that way? Um, it was actually, I was trying to figure out what to do and it was to, in talking to one of our interns, you know, we were like, oh, the fair is coming and thought, well, it would be really cool if we could sell at the fair. I wonder if there's openings, because at that point, the fair was about three weeks away. So we built a booth and pulled it together in a matter of three weeks, and it went off great. So yeah, it was just in talking to my intern and thinking, oh, this would be great. And it actually came to fruition, which was awesome. So <laughs> Great. And Julie, how are you bringing in cu customers or plan to bring in customers uh, in terms of bringing schools on board with what you're doing? I think that a lot of schools right now are realizing that it is important to teach coding, even if it's just on a level of like a recess club or something like that. Um, so I've just been reaching out to different schools. I have a lot of friends in the education sector, um, and also just a lot of friends in the tech sector in general, and a lot of people who are so passionate about teaching coding, because it's such a valuable skill. Especially for women and young girls, have you found that that has been a wall that you've been coming up against in your industry? Um, in, in my industry, I've definitely encountered that there, there is some bias against women in it and that sometimes there are much fewer women. Um, but in general, I think that we're on such a great upswing for it. I think that a lot of the programs are working really well. and. Um, for example, I recently started teaching at the Spruce Street School, a recess club, and just as many boys as, as, many, bo as many girls were so excited to come and code. And everyone felt like they were going to be able to code. There was never a question as to whether this was the boys club or the girls club. It was an everyone club. Coding in general is something that I think a lot of entrepreneurs in this day and age discuss. Do you, do you need do you need code? Do you need to know how to code? And it, in your opinion, I, I would say you should definitely be at least a little bit familiar with some of the basics. Um, chances are you're going to have to put up a website, no matter what you want to make or what you want to promote. Chances are you're going to have to put up a website, and it's going to be really tricky if you're super adverse to to getting your hands dirty with some code. What are the basics in coding? I know that sounds a little silly, but really it, it's, it's a challenge for, for many people to jump in. Absolutely, and I think that's one of those parts of coding that kind of discourages people from learning it, is that you feel like you need to learn this huge, immense thing, you need to learn all of these different topics. Um, and people will disagree with me on this, but I think that like, if you're going to learn any coding, first things first, you should just learn how to make a website. Um, you'll get curious after that, and you'll want to learn more about hard computer science topics, and you'll want to learn more about things like JavaScript and how to do more things with your website once you get that front-facing uh, look. Have you thought about, because it is such a service, have you thought about for-profit and non-profit models? Is, 
Is that in your Absolutely. That was a huge question for us, particularly looking at different grants to apply for and different programs to, to work Code of Pillar into. Um, but there's, there's definitely the opportunity to do a lot of social good with this project as a for-profit model, but definitely to keep it open because the most beautiful thing about the tech community, I think, is how open it is and all of these terrific open source projects um, and people who are so happy to share their code with others. What has surprised you? Is someone really going out of their way to help you? Can you give us an example of that, that you were just? Um, I've had a really fantastic experience with three professors at Pace. Um, the first was uh, Dr. Hill at the Computer Science School. He's the associate dean. And I told him about my idea, and he said, fantastic, we're going to make it happen. Just drop everything that you're doing. We're going to focus all of your energy on this. It's going to be great, <laughs> which was awesome. And he's been a phenomenal mentor throughout my entire time at Pace. Um, the other thing that I've been able to do at Pace is I have, I'm in the Honors College. And so two of our Honors classes, we can do something called an Honors Option, where we do an extra project in our classes for the Honors Credit. So the first class that I did that with was my Basic Principles of Design class, which I had a fantastic professor for, Derek Straup, who um, helped me create all these preliminary designs for it, make a catchy landing page, um, and walked me through like some of these design concepts that were going to be important for me to think about in terms of my web application. And now um, I'm taking my second honors option in my software engineering course with Christelle Scharf, who's helping me with like kind of the software engineering and deciding how to architect the application. And now it Obviously, uh, we have all ladies up here tonight, which is wonderful. Uh, have you, I, something that I'd like to touch upon uh, with gender and, and entrepreneurship, have you thought about the whole Sheryl Sandberg lean in concept and how that applies to your lives and how you want to move forward in the next five to 10 years with your careers and or having a family? Juliet. Um, I'm not really, I don't really know much about uh, the lean in, but um, no, I, I really ba balancing, know. balancing, I guess, oh, okay. you know, balancing, yeah. uh, balancing your career and uh, and also your work, uh, also a home life. Okay, yeah, actually I have thought about that. That's a good question. Um, for instance, in dance, you do a lot of your shows on the weekend. It's Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then you're promoting and rehearsing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Mm -hmm. So um, you have to figure out what's a good balance for you. The good part about um, dance is that it kind of like fluctuates in and out. So it's not always every week you're going to have a million things to do. One week is going to be like, this is hell week, which means the day, the week right before the show, or it's like starting to come up with a new idea, a new dance, a new finding new people. So um, I have been thinking about like, how am I going to balance it, you know, five years from now, like maybe I'll be married, maybe, who knows, maybe I'll have a kid. Um, because you know, on the weekends are the time that you, you, you have for your family, for for your friends, for um, your connections, kind of a thing. And I was thinking that I'd probably, me myself would probably dance maybe two of those days, or so have one day on the weekend. So let's say Sunday. Sunday's my day for my family, and then two days where I'm dancing, or have at least once a month where the whole weekend is off and I'm just with my family, I'm not dancing, I'm not doing any of that stuff. And obviously, not have rehearsal like every night of the week, maybe three nights of the week, and then the other nights of the week have it for my family, for my friends, for those connections, because support from those people is so vital to even having your company. Because you can't just be doing this on your own. It's a lot on, on you like psychologically, as well as, you know, uh, mentally and emotionally, and you need the support of a family and, and a friends and all those connections. You have to keep those ties intact. You can't just go off and be a workaholic and not talk to anyone. It's <laughs> not going to help you at all. <laughs> well, I think that's a great and very creative way to, to think about it. Is it something that you've thought about, Krista? Um, yes, most definitely. I actually recently got married in 
2013. So that year I got married, launched a business, and finished graduate school. It was pretty busy. Wow. <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, the five-year plan is definitely in the front of my mind. I mean, I still want to be able to run my business and have a family. Um, I'm hoping to have some employees at that point, so maybe that'll take a little less off my shoulders. Um, but yeah, so it's definitely in, in the cards, and you know, I want to have it all. Who doesn't, right? <laughs> right, girls? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Julie? Um, it's funny you mentioned the lean-in concept because we actually started recently a Pace Women in Technology lean-in circle, Olga and I did, with one of our That's friends right. at the Computer Science School for Women in Technology. And it's been fantastic. It's, we've been able to support each other a lot, and I've loved it. Um, in terms of a work-life balance in the future, well, I knew what I was getting into when I went into web development. And um, honestly, I'm not looking too hard at a family, and my mom would kill me if she heard me saying this. <laughs> um, but so I, I know that I, I want to dedicate a lot to teaching code because I feel like I'll have a, a huge impact in that way. Great. Now, do you find that the environment right now in the university mm -hmm. setting is very focused or interested in entrepreneurship? I definitely would say that here. I mean, I didn't know it existed until I was looking for it. But once I walked into the entrepreneurship lab, every day there'd be a new person coming in from a different country, a new person interested in helping the students. Uh, somebody from Israel came once, somebody uh, to talk about, what was it? There was a book that he wrote about. Um, there's a lot for us here that I didn't know existed until this year, which I'm really excited. And I know that the school is actually, uh, it's the anniversary, like 35 years of entrepreneurship at Pace University. And I think it's a very important and awesome resource that needs to be promoted more like this, because a lot of people don't even know it exists. But it's, it's why we're up here right now. We all want a grant, or we're finalists for a grant. That's why we're having this right now and I think so many people need to know that this exists because it's such a important and amazing resource here at the school. Absolutely. Krista, did you always have an entrepreneurial bug? Um, yes. Both my parents were entrepreneurs growing up so I got to kind of experience that ride with them um, and then when I started working for somebody else for many years I realized I really want to work for myself, you know. So I went back to school for, to get my MBA, and they actually have entrepreneurship here as a concentration, which I think is, is great. And I did not do that as my concentration, um, but I did take a business plan development class, and it was excellent, and it really helped me launch 50 Roots and get it off the ground and have a great business plan to move forward with. So, What is it about working for yourself when you, that's that's different. Um, you just you really I know I'm really passionate about. It. I've always been passionate about my work, but I'm passionate more so because it's me. I'm putting myself out there, and and I love it. I love being my own boss. I love calling the shots. You know, it's also a lot more responsibility. So <laughs> with that freedom comes a responsibility. But but it's a great feeling, you know, and to really believe in what you're doing and believe in your business. And so now, at this point, uh, you're about 44% of the states, is yes. that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how do you go out and w is there a state that you're really looking for products from that you can't? How, how, what is the process like of procuring uh, the vendors? Well, a lot of times, you know, we start with the product and think, oh, I really want to get a thermometer that's made in America. So, you know, I'll start searching everywhere, Googling thermometers made in the USA. Um, so a lot of times it starts with the product. Also, as I mentioned before, we go to several trade shows, gift shows. I'm going to a pet show next week because I'm really trying to expand the pet category. Um, and just walking every aisle, talking to every designer, every maker, every manufacturer, and see what they have. Um, we also have a section on our site where if you know a great product or know someone who makes one where you can submit it through the site and I'll, and I'll get the email and I'll review it and I'll contact the maker and you know, see if it's something that we can actually put up on our site. What are some of the most interesting products you've come across? Um, let me 
I think, most interesting. Well, we, I did uh, two weeks ago at a trade show a clay coffee maker, which was really for iced coffee, specifically for iced coffee. So it cools the water through copper as you're pouring it into this contraption. And you have your iced coffee. You don't have to chill it. It, it, was, it was so neat. And it was a, a young guy who was probably like 24 years old. You know, and he lives in Brooklyn. And he's trying to put the, this great iced coffee maker out there. So that was pretty cool. Great. <laughs> yeah. Do you find people are willing to pay a premium to have those products made in America? Because as we know, if you outsource it, it's going to be a lot cheaper. Uh, how do you balance, balance the price point of the um, products? Well, people are willing to pay a premium, but our prices are pretty you know, on point, pretty competitive. And people are willing to pay more for the quality, to know what, what they're buying, where it's coming from, you know, and also feeling good about supporting you know, small businesses, American economy, you know, designers. What, it, what has the response been from the people that you're selling the products? Um, very positive. Everyone, you know, I'll get emails after people receive, you know, their products. I love my, you know, my purchase. Thank you. I'm spreading this, spreading the word to my friend. I'm buying, doing all my Christmas shopping here next year, you know, because they're unique items, you know. It's not like um, going to Target. It's just everything has a great story. And I think with giving the gifts, people love to tell the story of the product. Can you uh, kind of walk us through the experience of what's a state uh, that you would like to be in that you're something that you're working on right now? Surprisingly, or? we do not have Texas yet, and I can't believe it. <laughs> yes. Okay. So if anyone knows anyone. <laughs> so you don't have anything from Texas. And, and so, so you say, I want to find a product that's made in Texas, and I'm going to curate it. How, I, I mean, can people? buy the product directly from that vendor, or how does it, that work? Yeah, people can buy um, directly from the vendor. And that was, again, one of my concerns when I launched. Why would somebody want to sell to me to retail it for them? But actually, uh, a lot of these designers, they, you know, they're a one-man, two-man show. They're small businesses. They don't want to focus on retail and shipping. They want just want to focus on their craft and what they do best, which is why a lot of them, too, don't like to drop ship either. They just want to sell to me directly, and then I'll retail it out there for them. So most of them just want to focus on what they love to do and not you know, managing the e-commerce side of things. What have you learned about the shipping process? Um, it's definitely, you know, a lot of work and, you know, I'm there every day packing boxes, taping them up. <laughs> um, but it was definitely a challenge logistics wise getting, you know, UPS and USPS synced in with my website, but we eventually figured it out. Um, but yeah, just, you can't have too many shipping options for the consumer. Um, and the other thing that we do offer on our site is because we're 50roots.com, we do free shipping on orders of $50 or more. So, Great. people love free shipping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know I do. <laughs> well, Julie, you're not you're not shipping anything, but uh, certainly uh, moving around ideas. Uh, so, where at this point, you you and Olga, do you want to expand, have more employees? Do you want to have an office? Do you what what do you foresee? Um, a really cool ultimate goal for us would be to be able to have workshops all around the world using the Codapillar platform, which would definitely require more manpower. Um, but it's a matter of training, training teachers for it, I think, and making sure that we have people who are really positive about coding and really love it the same way that we do. And can you tell me a little bit about how you started coding in the first place? Um, so. I started coding making MySpace layouts because I was obsessed with getting the perfect layout. And so I kind of started to dig into the source code and was just like, I need to change this, 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 and finally started to pick up on these things. Um, but I didn't realize that that was like what the internet ran on. I thought that was specific to MySpace. Uh, so it wasn't until I decided to be a computer science major um, because it seemed like the cool thing to do <laughs> uh, that 
I realized that like this was a very valuable skill that I'd been honing for a while. Um, and then I just continued to learn absolutely anything that I could uh, while I was at Pace. Do you think that coding should be in elementary schools, middle schools? I mean, how, how young should kids start? Um, if I could go back in time, I would have started in first grade. Um, there are tools out there that allow young people to understand these concepts. And now, like, first graders are using computers, and they're using computers better than a lot of the older generation. Um, and so I think that there's, there's really not like an age that people should limit themselves to, to coding at. I think that it's, it's a great skill to pick up at any time, but start as early as possible. Juliet, could you talk a little bit about the day-to-day -day operations? What, what does your company require you to do? Well, right now we're focusing on promotion, promotion, promotion. So <laughs> <laughs> um, figuring out um, you know, how, how are we going to get ourselves out there? How are the people going to find us, you know? And uh, playing around with a lot of social media these days, um, YouTube, and found that a lot of people find us on Instagram. Like, I just started the Instagram like five days ago, and I've been learning about like hashtagging, and I've been getting a lot of, so I, for instance, I used the poster from this event, and I was like, oh, hashtag, you know, entrepreneurs, women in business, and I've got a lot of response from like women in business and following us on Instagram. So I was really like, oh, I'm good at Instagram. Okay, this is good. You know, <laughs> just trying to realize like what, what will help you um, get it out there kind of a thing. So like figuring out the social media, creating new dances, like there's a new dance going on in my head like every single day. Um, I don't know how to describe that, but basically a song will come on and I see little people dancing in my head and that's how it happens. <laughs> um, so um, so you're, you're making choreography, you're setting up rehearsals, you're setting up auditions, you're setting up the costumes. Um, recently we also did a video for more promotion to JLo's new song, Booty. Yes, um, which actually, <laughs> why, don't you, why don't you tell the audience a little bit about this? So it's kind of about like uh, cultural perception of women's beauty. So like um, each, so each style represents a uh, part of the world. So for instance, like contemporary would signify like U.S. or America or Western, and uh, then there's Bollywood, which would Bollywood, which would signify Indian beauty, and then there's the Latin style that would you know signify people from like Puerto Rico or South America or something like that. And so basically, in the beginning. What we have is somebody pretending to like paint a picture of each unique woman because every woman in our group is like of a different culture. I have someone from South Africa. I have somebody was from Spain. She left, but we're still finding new people. So each person is unique and different. Um, and then there's a full on dance where everyone's wearing the same costume, but just to show that you know, we're all women, we're all beautiful, and then we go off into the different types of dances. So there's a Bollywood section, there's an, a Latin section, there's a contemporary section. In the end, we all come together and we dance together, and it's all the fusion of all the different styles that come together, showing world beauty, all that everything is beautiful. So I'm excited for that one. Well, talking about social media, I'm glad you, uh, you're on, <laughs> on Instagram. Uh, what, are, what are you guys finding uh, is most helpful for you with social media, Krista. Um, which platform? Like which the, platform? Yeah, so um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. At this point, Facebook, I think definitely. Facebook. Yeah, we get the most traffic and the most response and the most um, interaction for our Facebook followers. But Instagram's growing and Twitter's growing. Um, but I think you know it's the demographics too. You know, are I want to say like thirty to 60 year old customers more comment on Facebook and then you know the 18 to 30 on Instagram. Have so. you looked at the on Facebook they have the advertising for small businesses where you can target in to like a certain gender or age range or or and get your ad out there. It's very interesting. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm I see it, you know, all the time. I haven't um, tried it yet, but but I'm planning on it definitely. 
And Julie, are you on, you must be on all the social media platforms. What is the most helpful to you? So um, it's kind of funny because I actually manage social media for a lot of different companies like places back home in Connecticut and um, a lot of different like groups that I'm a part of. Um, with Codapillar, I personally have had a lot of luck with Twitter because I've reached out to people and all of these different coding communities that are present, um, especially on Twitter. Um, but these were already like communities kind of that I had cultivated myself over the years. Um, Facebook was very helpful for us. We were recently doing a grant competition um, with the Ericsson Innovation Awards, and we like directly reached out to every single one of our Facebook friends and asked them to vote for us. That's great, <laughs> wonderful. So, what do you think of the the fact that it's all women tonight? Awesome. That 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 in the, in the end, all the finalists were women. That excites me. Um, I feel like a lot of people in business, well, you, you always kind of think of the, the men are the top, the CEOs and all that stuff. And it's, I find it very inspiring that all of us are, are women here tonight because you don't often see just a full panel of women talking about women in business. That's mind-blowingly awesome. My, in my opinion. Um, actually, it's kind of funny, go, uh, relating it to dance, I find that a lot of the dance businesses, a lot of the studios, a lot of the dance entertainment businesses, all of them are run by women, so I'm actually used to women being at the forefront, being my inspiration to start my own, my own venture, not even just in dance, but I have a cousin who's a hairstylist, and who has her own hair salon in New Jersey. So just having somebody in my own family that started her own thing and is living off of her own, you know, her, her own passion, her own idea, that's very inspiring. And I think we need to show that to young girls that look, you can be your own boss. Look, you can start your own thing in what you believe in and what you're passionate about. Because so many people, you know, go toward the practical idea, be the employee, play it safe, especially girls are told to play it safe. But I think we need to, to go harder, take more risks. I think that's really important. And this, this helps to inspire more girls to do that. Obviously, Julie, you're with the Lean In group. What do you think of, of all women tonight? Um, it's something that I kind of don't think about really with business because I'm so concerned with it in the technology side. Um, but hey, why not? Women are smart and hardworking and passionate, so I don't see why this wouldn't be realistic. <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you think needs to be done in the technology sphere to get more women into technology and more women into coding? Um, I think that it is getting better just because the younger generations are already used to this idea of having a lot of women in technology. It's usually when I encounter an issue with it, it's usually an older gentleman who is just not adapted to the idea that a 22-year-old girl is also going to be working on the database with him. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that, that once that starts to happen more often and it won't come as such a shock, <laughs> to people who have been in the tech industry for so long um, that it won't be a problem anymore. And Krista, what do you think about having all women here tonight? Oh, I think it's incredible. And when you know the four finalists when we were all announced, I was so excited to see that it was all women. You know, I was really surprised, pleasantly surprised. So it's, it's great. So obviously being an entrepreneur uh, can be nerve-wracking. Mm -hmm. What part of the business keeps you up at night at this point? Hmm. Just, you know, growing. What's next? You know, what's the next step? And, you know, I have those things planned out, but, you know, things don't always go according to plan, you know? Just, I want to be as successful as possible. So I'm always thinking about how could I do that better and what I have done, how could I have done that better, you know, going forward, so. What's the biggest lesson that you've learned? Just to um, be courageous, you know, take, take chances. You're, you know, if you don't try, you won't move forward at all. And you can't be afraid of failure. I mean, if you do fail, it's just a stepping stone for what's next. And, and I don't consider trying and 
failing, even a failure in, it's, in itself, you know, it's just, it's something you learn from and just keep going with it and you can't be afraid to put yourself out there like that, so. How do you bounce back from failure? I mean, we've all suffered setbacks. Um, so, it's like playing a basketball game where you have the ball and you need to do something with it, but you have like this, this negativity over here, somebody's blocking you over here, and you have a huge problem over here, you can't get over here. But just because you have some problems, the game isn't over, you still have to do something with the ball. Um, so it's just the ability to pivot and find a different route. <laughs> Your thoughts? Um, I totally agree with every, everything my <laughs> fellow panelists just said. I think, I mean, this is something like integral to myself that's just always keep picking yourself back up because, um, I mean, also being a dancer, being in the performing arts, you're used to rejection after rejection after rejection. And it might not even be because of your talent. It might be, because, might be because of the way you look or the way you act or they're judging you for a silly reason, in my opinion. Um, and not just that, but like so many people challenge you to be even part of the performing arts. Why are you in that? You can't make any money off of that. That's not a real career. What are you doing? You know, that's been something I've heard for the last 22 years of my life. So I think I'm, I'm used to challenge and people telling me no. So I said, no, I will do this. And I've gotten a lot of yes. I got a yes from the Ted Levine grant. I got a yes from the, the Honors College here. I got a grant to actually create fusion dance for my senior solo, my senior thesis. So I've gotten a lot of yes for being in the performing arts here. So I'm like, I don't care what anyone thinks anymore because I, it keeps on working out somehow. So I'll just <laughs> keep on going. That's great, that's great. <laughs> well, I don't know where Bruce is right now. I, I don't know if you wanna jump in. Uh, right now and, and uh, we want to do a little Q&A or? Right. Yeah, thank you. So that was, uh, I, I love the basketball analogy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a um, really great week. We do have time for Q&A. And again, if you would um, like to, to tweet your questions, you're welcome to or raise your hand. We'll have people with a microphone. I did also want to talk a little bit about the entrepreneurship program. It's exactly 35 years old. It was formally established in 1979, one of the earliest programs in the country. The Entrepreneurship Lab is only three years old, and we do have a variety of classes. The class that um, you mentioned, that Paige Checky, who's also not here, and it's called Entrepreneurial Implementation, where students have to implement some aspect of a business. Um, the class Krista was in the business plan development class. She mentioned she was also the winner of the uh, 10th annual business plan competition. And um, Paige was uh, the winner of the, uh, of the pitch contest last year. So we try to do a lot of things for entrepreneurship. And again, what was rewarding is, is not just having all women on the panel, but from across the, the six schools and colleges, because that idea of collaboration is you know, so important. So. If you would um, like to ask a question, uh, as I say, we'll, we'll have um, about 15 minutes for Q and A. It's good. We're right on schedule, and then we do have a, a wine and cheese reception. I'll introduce um, Marie Tulantis for the the uh, closing remarks and and to invite you to the uh, reception. But let's take some questions, and they could be for anyone. So great, we have microphone. someone right here. Hi everyone. Really Hi. enjoyed the panel discussion. Um, my name is Anastasia. I have like a, a burning question that's been on my mind for a while, um, and it's open to anyone. Um, do you have a difficult time connecting with men and women that fall into that kind of complacent, non-risk taker employee role? Now that everyone is kind of taken on this, they've cha you've changed your lives with the your entrepreneurship. Do you find now that you have a hard time connecting with people that are playing it safe? Uh, well, I wouldn't say I have a hard time connecting. I end up arguing with them a lot and being like, why aren't you pursuing your passions? Actually, it's kind of funny. This is kind of an argument I've had with my boyfriend. 
uh, and he's in like a commerce school, an MBA program, and they push, you know, play it safe, do the big four, do what will make you the most money. And I'm like, is that really going to make you happy at the end of the day? If you have $100,000 in your pocket, is that really going to make you happy? You know, and I feel like a lot of people end up doing um, what will make me the most money instead of what will make me the happiest. So I try to always, whenever I encounter anyone like that, I'm like, so, are you going to be happy about that? You know you're going to work like 12 hours every single day. Are you sure you want to do that? So I always start a discussion with them about it. Um, I don't really. Actually, I haven't really encountered that. Um, I do have a big circle of people who are really interested in entrepreneurship, but I would say the majority of my friends still aren't really into it. Yeah, um, I don't really have any issues connecting either. I mean, I don't really know too many people like that, which I guess is a good thing. And you know, if, if that's their choice and, and they're happy with that, then I support that 100%. So. I can say that uh, I think people with the entrepreneurial bug, you recognize it in other people and then you, you connect with them because People who are entrepreneurs, I believe, are always saying, uh, why not? Let's figure it out. Let's solve a problem. Whereas someone of a different mindset, it's not right or wrong, good or bad, may say, well, here are the problems. And for me, I don't, I don't want to hear about the problems. I want to hear about the solutions. I want to I want to hear how to create and that's so when I see these women up here who are creating who are saying why not let's go for it there is that connection and I think that uh, you immediately have that connection with like-minded people and just to um, as I'm not part of the pen but what we talk a lot about here is an entrepreneurial mindset, a way of thinking that you're able to recognize, analyze, and capture opportunity and to add value by solving problems. And it's a broader mindset. And you're seeing that more, whether you call it intrapreneurship, entrepreneurship in a company. One of the other grants we received last semester was from Blackstone, from the Blackstone Charitable Foundation to train veterans in entrepreneurship. And we're running that now. And it's to take a mindset and um, think how can they do something that they're really passionate about, and that's a really important part of entrepreneurship, and apply the skills and get them done wherever they're doing. And you're seeing organizations like even the Army becoming more entrepreneurial, and we're pleased that there's quite a few uh, women in the, in the uh, Veterans Entrepreneurship Boot Camp as well. How about a, uh, another question? Yeah, uh, Ted Levine, I'm the person who's involved in the fund that the <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. I, I've been involved about 53 years in entrepreneurship, and I guess one of the things that surprised me the most and is not often talked about, and I'd love to have all, all five of you maybe comment on it, is the role of luck. Uh, in, in my particular firm, the biggest client we ever got was Trinidad and Tobago, or at least the, the, early, or the earliest client that we got that was really big. It's because I sat on a bench in a park with, there were a million people in Trinidad and Tobago at that time, I sat on a bench with the perfect person who was the president of the Trinidad and Tobago Economic Development Council. And in that one day, we worked out the whole program, became our biggest client. I'm curious as to whether luck has played a role in any of your experience, because in mine, it was a very big one. Krista, why don't um, Yeah, I mean, I, luck is definitely part of it. It always seems to play a role. I mean. I was very lucky to win the Ted and Pat Levine um, grant, so that was definitely a lucky break for me, I feel. <laughs> I've definitely been lucky with um, just the timing of, in the schools that I'm talking to. I think that the timing has been really important for me because all, all of these schools now, like even the Spruce Street School, is just starting their coding initiative and they're right across the street. So that's, that's been just a super lucky break that I was able to go in there and start uh, teaching code with them. 
And also, um, my old middle school and high school just recently started teaching coding, and so I had those connections, but it's just been at exactly the right time, exactly the right year, with the idea already in motion. I think uh, luck has been a theme throughout <laughs> my life. Um, for instance, getting into this school, I learned about Pace University on a bus bench in June of 2011, two months before I'm supposed to go to school, and I went, you know what, why not try out for that new dance program that didn't exist before, and look where I am now. <laughs> um, so that, and then my friend happened to notice the um, entrepreneurship uh, class that I took with uh, Professor Bockenheimer, who then told me about the Ted Levine grant. Um, so luck is just something that has been part of my life, but it only, it's only luck unless you go for that opportunity. If that opportunity comes your way, you have to take it. You can't be like, oh, I can't do that, or else you're never going to get anywhere. You have to take that opportunity, because actually it's funny because that opportunity with the Ted Levine grant was out there, but only 18 people actually applied for it. That's a really small number, and there's so many people here. So you have to actually go for that opportunity, and then it'll come back to you. I, I think you become very lucky as an entrepreneur if you are ready, you're prepared, you're willing. That, that's what I've found because there are all these random things that happen every day and if you're an entrepreneur, you always have your eyes out looking, what, what's going to help further the business, further the cause? And so you might think of it as luck, but it's really, I think, your eyes were wide open. You saw the potential. You saw that person who could be an additional client or that could be part of your company, a great employee. I think, I think, luck, is, I think luck is definitely underestimated. Uh, it really is. And, uh, I hope we're all blessed with lots of luck. <laughs> when I um, put on a midterm, you know, which of these are important for entrepreneurship and a multiple choice, and I'll list luck, people often get it wrong by assuming that that one's not. So let me give you a, two quotes. I had a, a business down in Annapolis, Annapolis Maritime Corp, and there's a little deli there, Chick and Ruth Deli, and Chick Levitt used to say, the harder I work, the luckier I get. But the best quote is from someone who may be my my favorite entrepreneur, even though he's not really an entrepreneur, he was a professor at Carnegie Mellon University, Randy Pausch. He uh, wrote the book, The Last Lecture. And he said, luck is where preparation meets opportunity. And, and that's what I believe. Absolutely. And next yeah. question. Hi, everyone. My name is Tiona. I'm from City College of New York, uh, Zahn Center for Entrepreneurship. And I, I was very inspired to hear all of you talk. And um, my question is, uh, with starting a business, there's always a lot of uncertainty. So how did all of you, or how do you deal with that uncertainty till this day? Thank you. Juliet? Well, for me, uh, if you start a business, it's usually because you're passionate about something. I'm passionate about dance. She's passionate about coding. You know. Um, it's the passion that keeps you going. It's like, yeah, I could fail at this, but if I don't do this, I'm going to regret this. As I'm going to be sitting and doing someone else's project, I'm going to be in somebody else's dance, and I'm going to be in somebody else's business, and I'm going to be like, wow, that could have been me. I could have been the head. I could have led this. But if you, if you just sit back, you're, you're going to regret it. So I'd say the passion. It's like, yes, oh, look at that dance that's finally out. Oh, I'm doing this wedding, I'm doing this pop show, I'm back up dancing for this singer who found me, who found my Bollywood dance on Facebook and then messaged me, please be my dancer. Yes, okay. So you just got the passion. Like, don't forget that. I'm horribly nervous because I'm about to graduate and um, <laughs> it's not like I have a backup <laughs> of money to, to like sit on while I work on my idea. Um, also, I have a lot of really terrific career opportunities as a web developer. Um, so right now, it's kind of deciding how, how I'm going to work in my business with also making money so that I can still eat and live in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely horrifying. 
Um, well, I definitely agree with Juliet that passion plays a huge role in it. You have to really be passionate about what you do, and there's always a degree of uncertainty. And I mean, I'm still nervous about so many things, um, but you just plan the best you can. And a lot of times things go, don't go according to plan, and it's just kind of rolling with the punches and just reacting as best you can to the uncertainties that come up along the way. And I think with the uncertainty, uh, you, you have to put buffers in there. Sometimes cash flow is good, sometimes it's not. And what do I have in place to balance what's happening? And this is a, I think that this is a great time in history to be an entrepreneur because everything is 24 seven. We have this amazing technology. You can, if you want, if you need to do a nine to five to make money to support your business, you can do that. I, I think it's figuring out what you need to survive and then thrive. Okay, over. Do we have a microphone right here? Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Josephine. I'm Pace graduate and a CFO of a nonprofit in Manhattan. And as I'm hearing you speak, you're very knowledgeable about your products and your service. Where do you gather your resources for all the administrative, you know, the junk, the contracts for the dance, you know, at the wedding, or you know, the sales tax, incorporating all the all the necessary evils that come with the administration end of your business. What have been your resources? And I just want to say, as a workaholic, mother of three, don't let anybody tell you it can't be done. It can be done. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did with all the paperwork, administrative stuff? Um, well, uh, Google. Uh, Google, 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 <laughs> Google, and then um, uh, taking the entrepreneurship class that I took helped uh, a lot. <laughs> I just keep bringing it back. <laughs> I mean, he, he made us do a whole uh, research on 25 documents you should know as an entrepreneur. So like, what's an angel investor? What's this type of investor? How do you get a loan? How do you make a legal document? Legal Zoom, you, you know, just all stuff online is where I find stuff. And then people, I actually have like a partner who helps me with the business stuff. She's been in business for a little while. She was also on a dance crew. So she's a dancer and a business person. So she's done a lot of like business related. She has more business knowledge than I do. So sometimes I let her do that more than I do, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> I rely pretty heavily on Google as well. Um, but I'm also really fortunate. I've been working in the tech startup community for two years, and I have so many supportive uh, friends who have their own businesses or who help businesses, particularly tech startups, who I can call at any minute. Yeah, um, Google, definitely. LegalZoom is very helpful. I'm actually very fortunate. My business partner has been an entrepreneur for 20 years, so I'm very lucky to be able to bounce some things off of him and. He can, you know, provide me with some guidance when I need it. So it's great <laughs> and very I, helpful. I think that it really the online resources are extraordinary these days. So if I'm very immediate, I want to know about something. What is blah blah blah? And I get the video, listen, and maybe that person says something that sparks me to Google something else. And so it's just. Figuring, figuring, following that that line. I think we have time for uh, one more question. I just have a kind of like a fun question. Has anyone thought about going on Shark Tank to get their, <laughs> uh, to get their idea out? Because you know they really push for women and entrepreneurship. And I do see that. I mean, I watch the show religiously. I think it's amazing. So I, has anyone thought about that? Has it ever crossed your mind? Or if not, have you thought about maybe reaching out to a celebrity, maybe per, like, giving them like a free like product, like made something made in the USA, and then if they post about it, then you, pretty much you will acquire all their followers and get the word out that way. Just wondering either 
So anybody interested in going on Shark Tank? <laughs> um, Shark Tank is my favorite show, and I've been already thinking about all the like creative things that I could do for my pitch there, different costumes and you know all those, the the fun things. <laughs> Have you ever thought about? Um, yes, and it's been. Uh, asked of me by family members, um, and it's actually interesting because a lot, several products we carry on our site, the makers have been on Shark Tank. So, you know, even when we did our pop-up shop, people would walk by and say, oh, there's the La La Cup, which was, you know, the only sippy cup for kids made in the USA. I don't, I'm not sure if you saw that episode, but, oh, that was on Shark Tank, you know, and it's great. So maybe, I don't know, we'll see. <laughs> I haven't really thought about Shark Tank, but um, in dance, you know, you you'd want to like dance for like J-Lo or, or like a big artist and like I've got a lot of people be like why don't you like do a dance well that's also why I did J-Lo's song Booty because it's a new song that's coming out like if you hashtag her in and if she finds it who knows maybe she'll want to bring you on tour or another like uh, YouTube celebrity I love is uh, Superwoman and she's like an Indian uh, she's a community ugh, sorry in the Indian community and she has a lot of uh, followers, Bollywood followers, a lot of rapper followers and stuff like that. So YouTube collaborations type of stuff I'm thinking about. Well, to, to wrap up uh, go, going off the, uh, the Shark Tank idea, I, I can tell you that when I was starting my program, I really wanted to interview Barbara Corcoran. And so I uh, called the office, and she gets a lot of requests. My program was not established. Uh, I kept calling, sending emails to the assistant, and I really wasn't getting anywhere. So I heard that Barbara was going to be the keynote speaker at this women's conference in New Hampshire. And so as the entrepreneur, I, call, I called the lady in New Hampshire. I said, if I come up and do this, com come to this conference, are you going to get me an er interview with Barbara Corcoran? And she said, yes. So I drove up to New Hampshire, <laughs> hired a local photographer off Craigslist, stayed in a motel by the side of the road, and went to this New Hampshire conference. But I had a beautiful one-on-one -on -one interview with Barbara Corcoran that I wouldn't trade for the world. And the best part is that I ran into Barbara Corcoran at the Starbucks like a couple of months ago on the Upper East Side. And I was like, I don't know if you remember me, <laughs> but I'm the crazy woman from New York who came all the way up to New Hampshire to get that interview. And she was so nice and she was so sweet and she was, she was terrific because I was holding a bunch of things in my hand and I, and I just, went to shake shake her hand like that and she said she put down her stuff she said okay i want to make sure that you have a firm handshake when the next person that you talk to and so she put down her things and she said this is how you shake hands with someone uh so uh that's you, you want to call that entrepreneurship luck not sure but it's having eyes wide open so I hope that you all continue to have eyes wide open because I think it's a beautiful concept and I think uh, entrepreneurship is a beautiful thing and especially a beautiful thing to see with women. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and, and Barbara Corcoran, the segment appeared as uh, one of the experts on, on the Working Women Report. Um, I'd, I'd like to, actually, just before I um, call Marie Tulantis, uh, we have something for the panelists, uh, one from here. I'm now playing Vanna White. <laughs> <laughs> this, these are from the uh, Alumni Relations and Development staff. And these. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And these are uh, solid diamond plaques are from the entrepreneurship lab. Oh wow! Look at our crystal. Yeah. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. I didn't know I was gonna get treat oh, you. Thank you. Plaques <laughs> and whatever's in here. So. Uh, Marie 
Chulantis. Marie is a member of Pace University's Board of Trustees, a former CEO of BarnesandNoble.com, and Senior Vice President at J.P. Morgan Chase. Today, Marie is here representing PACE's uh, Women in Business Steering Committee and will provide some closing remarks. Yeah, thanks, Bruce. And again, thank you all. This was just a really terrific presentation by our panelists and, uh, I, and our moderator, it's, uh, it was very inspiring. And uh, you know, I, I don't even think Bruce knows this, but back in the day when I was here at Pace, now I'm, I'm not gonna tell you the year because I'll really date myself here, but uh, um, it was the very beginning of the entrepreneurship program, which you said started in 79. Uh, and uh, I took the class. And you know, this is before we had computers and all this, right? So uh, we had our big spreadsheets and we had this model company that we all had to work on and figure out ways to you know, market it, make it grow, finance it, and the whole bit. And uh, the professor was great. And we set up these different groups. And uh, we all had these companies to work on. And uh, the company that, um, the group that I was in, uh, we actually, our company went bankrupt. <laughs> So, uh, because we, we overspent, but it was like a really important lesson because the professor basically said, that's okay, because what you did is you took a risk, you overspent, okay, in terms of, you know, in this model, it was about the marketing and how to finance it and all that, but uh, he said it was okay, and he, and I actually ended up getting an A in the course, and I said, well, this is really weird, I got an A in a course, and we, you know, it's part of this group, and the company went belly up, and uh, said no, because the important lesson was that you guys were really went for it and you know it, it's okay you learned from what you did wrong you learned um, and uh, it was a, just such a great lesson and and here I am so many years later uh, you know talking to you guys about entrepreneurship so it all started here back in I don't want to say the year but anyway <laughs> so uh, <laughs> <laughs> see that, see that. But uh, but again, I, I'm just so uh, you know inspired by these young women, and uh, feel like you know we're in good hands with uh, this generation that's coming up. And loved a lot of the analogies and a lot of the stories. Of course, you know the passion. I loved your basketball and agile. That's a good one for your classes, Bruce. You know, right? Yeah, keep the pivot going because uh, in business, yeah, that's definitely what you uh, what you have to keep doing is keep pivoting because there always are obstacles. You know, whether it's that uh, bully coworker or bully boss or who may or may not be a man. Sorry to the men in the audience. But anyway, yeah. But there's always an obstacle, and to see the opportunity in it, you know, to recognize, as you said, uh, it's not luck. It's, it's how to have your eyes wide open when you see that opportunity. You know, that's, that's the most important thing because so many people just, they miss it. You know, they just totally miss it. Anyway, but uh, so we formed this group. We decided uh, on the Board of Trustees, um, uh, that I've been a member of for a number of years, um, that we needed a, a group um, and we formed a committee and it's women in business, um, the uh, trustee liaison for it. We have a number of our members and we've only actually had one meeting. It's just a brand new group. So who's here from the group? We have Deirdre, you're here, right? a number of us are here. And uh, the idea around the group is to figure out ways that we can you know, engage some of our um, female uh, you know, fellow alums, our current students in figuring out ways to engage them with PACE, try to figure out opportunities, whether it's uh, networking and opportunities or opportunities to um, you know, meet other people and similar businesses. And so we decided this would be a good uh, venture for us to undertake. Uh, this is uh, the first um, you know, event that we have uh, co-sponsored, um, thanks to uh, Bruce, and again, thanks to Bruce for putting it all together. So again, we really appreciate uh, this opportunity to be part of this, and uh, welcome uh, you all to a little cocktail reception that we're having in the bank in the back uh, thereafter so hopefully you can stick around have a drink and we can chat some more thank you, thank you.